So welcome everybody to the sixth masterclass in the boardroom series. Um, I'd like to introduce to you guys today, Erin. Um, he graduated with a first class degree in economics in 2002, and he's the founder of Blend. So yeah, I'll turn over to Erin and he can introduce himself. Hi everyone. Uh, first of all, you know, thanks to Sheffield for you know having me having me do this. It's it's actually quite a, kind of an honor. Um, and thanks to you guys for for turning up. I know it's a uh, you know you're busy, um, and it's uh, hopefully it's insightful, um, and I answer some of your some of your questions and, and help you in some small way. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. You know, you know, I, I'm Aaron, and, and I graduated uh, economics uh, 2002 um, after receiving um, you know an economic and social research council scholarship. I went on to do uh, a master's and PhD. And uh, I went on to the University of Warwick to complete my master's um, in economics before leaving for San Francisco. Um, I chose not to embark on my life of, life of academia. Um, however, you know, I have really fond memories of my time at Sheffield and, you know, still keep in contact with many of my friends there uh, through the alumni network and, and, and some more personally. Um, it's definitely something I hope Sheffield keeps working to create better networks amongst its alumni. And something that I know that I'm a part of too. I think it's it's incredibly important, and particularly the contrast of you know coming from England to to the United States, um, where the alumni network here is incredibly tight, um, and they support students in their careers further. And I I, I think that's that's a great model that we're we're going to you know try and implement. Um, before I begin, I want to stress that this class you know is is titled you know selling yourself. Um, but it's more broad than that. It, it applies to almost everything we do in life. Um, you know, whether you work in academia or you start your own company or you work for a large corporate, you have, have to develop the ability to market yourself, your idea, your, your policy recommendation, your research really well, uh, whatever it may be. Um, the class is not a 10 step program on how to ace an interview or how to be a marketing guru. Um, but we all need to realize we're in the business of selling, um, whether we kind of realize it or not. Um, and so I wanted to start this, this class with a little bit of a, a personal background. I think, um, you know, it gives a lot of context and I think that is one of the most important pillars of selling yourself. If you want to sell yourself effectively, you have to find common connection with your audience. And that often comes from sharing something sort of very genuine about yourself. Um, so, so here's my backstory. You know, I moved to San Francisco uh, after meeting Peter Thiel through a mutual friend. Um, you know, I wasn't sure of I wanted to continue my PhD after work uh, and Sheffield, and I, I was, and after talking to a family friend, he recommended I talk to to Peter for guidance on what to do. Um, and Peter, at the time, um, was recently finished selling PayPal to eBay. Um, so as you, you might know, he's one of the founders of PayPal, along with Elon Musk, uh, Max Levchin, and a few others. Um, and it turned out he was looking for an econometrician for his macro hedge fund in San Francisco, which he decided to start after his success in tech. Um, for those of you just out of university, uh, your first job, uh, it's an incredible feeling when you get it, but there's also extremely, it's extremely nerve wracking. Um, while you know that you're extremely well equipped technically, you, you let what's called imposter syndrome enter. And it's kind of this doubt about your ability to keep up with your new coworkers. And I want to assure you that it's completely normal. I remember having that feeling like this, this going over to, to a new country and working with these incredibly smart people all from sort of Stanford and MIT and all that. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, intimidating, but you know, one of the biggest steps in overcoming your self-doubt and turning up with confidence is to trust in your training and years of hard work. Um, you know, I think that this is important to remember that a lot of the time, you know, the pieces of paper that hang on our, our walls, um, the, de the degrees that hang on our walls aren't actually the degrees, you know, we are. Um, we're the years of training. And I think that sometimes we forget that. So, you know, after working with Peter for about, you know, close to a decade, um, I was appointed head trader of his hedge fund, uh, managing at, at the peak about eight billion, uh, which was Clarion Capital. Um, you know, the financial crisis came came along and exposed what a huge role housing has in our economy, and more importantly, our everyday lives. And I think that 
that financial crisis almost impacted every single person that I know today, whether it's, whether it's you or it's your, your parents, um, we were all touched by it in, in some sort of small way and sometimes a really big way. Um, and so I decided to start a company um, that was squarely focused on financial technology. Um, the decision you know, to do so was kind of twofold. Um, one, I, I had the, I guess, the privilege to work with someone who was a successful tech investor. You know, he was, you know, founded PayPal. <clears throat> he was the first investor in Facebook. Um, and he, he started Palantir. There's, there's a bunch of others, you know, invested in Airbnb. And the second piece is my years in finance showed me how there were huge gaps in, in how people transacted with one another, like these pain points which needed fixing. Um, and so I started Blend with two other people from Palantir Technologies, uh, which looked to allow to get paperless mortgages from their laptop or mobile phone instead of having to walk into a bank uh, and fill in 2,000 pages of documents. And that's not an exaggeration. Um, you, you know, if, if you have a go on a mortgage, your parents probably do, and they will tell you it's an incredible pain. Um, and so today we built it from quite literally a few guys in a, in, in a, an apartment to, you know, 400 employees. Uh, and we, we count some of the biggest, the biggest banks, uh, as our customers. Um, the exciting part about it wasn't just that we were getting people into their homes, but that a mortgage was this data superset. So if, if any of you are, you know, play a lot with data, um, this is kind of the best part. It's, it's kind of, you're dealing with a product that's a superset of everything that someone does in their entire life. Uh, I know it, mortgage is kind of so boring, but when you really think about it, what it's doing is it's collecting vast amounts of data on you, your social security or your, your pay stubs or where you worked before or what house you're about to buy, your income stream. Um, and it's one of the financial products that contains the more data and information than anything else on you in the world. You know, maybe, maybe aside from like genetic testing. Um, we know that if we could get this product into a digital and machine readable format, we could essentially dominate all other banking products because we already had all that data because all other products are a data subset of that. Um, so we were already handling the hardest financial product for the banks and then being able to offer customers, uh, their customers products that were subsets of that was basically a piece of cake. And so that was, that's our wedge. That was, that's what we called our wedge into the, into the industry. When we when we started in 2012, uh, 2012, we were we were we were laughed out the room. Um, you know, quite literally, when, when we try to get a new customer, you know, we were told that no one would even you know get a mortgage on their mobile phone, um, and people would never be interested in doing this at all digitally. They would always prefer sitting down with someone in person. Um, and sort of eight years later, we learned not only was how wrong that person was, but while that technology was never meant to replace the, the human touch. It, it, in fact, empowered people to use it more effectively. Um, and, then, and then after you know, the pandemic of COVID-19, it's pretty clear just how important a digital alternative really is in order for life to kind of move forward uh, in a meaningful way. So people still need to you know, get into their new homes regardless of whether there's, there's a pandemic. And, still, you know, and in other industries like healthcare, people still need to receive health whether there's a pandemic or not. Um, and so when we started, we never expected to find the sort of um, insights that we did. So um, some insights from starting the company, it wasn't just about a product, but it became more about allowing people access to capital that otherwise wouldn't have had it. Um, for instance, we discovered that people with low income families were three times more likely to apply for a mortgage on their mobile phone. And we scratched our heads for a while, like, why would this be? But you know, it made sense since low income families typically don't have laptops or desktops. So the company became more than just offering a digital roadmap to get into your home. It was about serving uh, a community or, or, or a big segment of the population that didn't have access before. Uh, and so that was incredibly rewarding. So that's, that's when your, your, your company, your vision is, is starting to be realized in ways that you, you never imagined. And I think that's, that's really motivating and it provides a lot of purpose. Um, a couple of learnings along the way for, for people who are looking to do their own, their own company or just, you know, have to manage their own team. Um, what's interesting is, you know, I kept running into this, this complete fallacy and this kind of leads into how into selling yourself and your team and your vision. Um, it's a fallacy where it's like the best proven product always wins. Um, or if you have like the best product and talent, you will automatically be successful. 
the common like build it and they will come fallacy. Um, there was always something fundamentally wrong about this approach. I could see it in every successful business uh, that it took that it took more than just a good product and talent to win. Uh, it took an amazing sales team and an awareness that your company needed to finance itself to, to keep itself alive, uh, which also in involves selling your idea and your team potential. Uh, you know, in fact, it's been my experience in Silicon Valley that you know what's called the cult of the engineer, uh, essentially. You know the idea that engineers are the talent at a tech startup, and everyone else is kind of superfluous. Uh, when in fact, every person you know on your sales team to your CEO is vitally needed uh, in selling your product and vision to the company, um, even down to thinking through the company's principles, the culture involved in every team and every de department. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is is that it's not just about a group of people who are technically very talented. It takes more than that. It takes, you know, it takes your finance department or your CFO to go sell that to a group of investors. It takes your CEO, you know, to be able to sell that vision to, you know, his own, his own employees, his or her own employees. Um, every single day, you know, we had to stand up in front of our employees and make them motivated and, you know, keep getting them to buy into our vision of where we wanted to take this company. That's all selling. I mean, if you ask any good CEO, you know, what their basic job is, you know, it's like the most important person at the company, they will, a really good CEO will tell you that basically selling to potential customers and selling vision to employees uh, is their main job. They're basically salespeople, um, if you really want to boil it down that way. And I think, you know, w w regardless of your aspirations, whether you want to go into the commercial world or if you want to stay in academia, uh, I think, you, you know, you need to realize that you're, you're kind of selling um, a product or your skill set. And uh, I think it's vitally important that you, you know, you, you practice it. Um, so kind of moving, moving on to more of the meat and potatoes of what we're about to talk to today. Um, I think that one of the interesting things about selling yourself, the first one, is that, you know, people in general like the next big thing rather than the big thing today. So, you know, when we look, you know, to hire people, or do business with people or invest in their, their teams or their, their vision, you know, it turns out that human beings um, are actually biased to choose the potential for success over actual success. You know, there's, there's been a bunch of studies on this where people consistently gave more value to the candidate with leadership potential rather than the candidate with proven leadership ability. Uh, and the same is true over people preferring, you know, artwork over artists with, uh, with potential to win awards, over the ones who actually have, or even restaurants with the potential. Um, why? You know, a lot, of, a lot of the research shows that basically it's because the potential for success is less certain. And so our brains are automatically wired such that if it is uncertain, we pay a lot more attention to it. And so, you know, we think harder basically about the information. And if that information is favorable, then we unconsciously give it more value. So what this means is that it's not only important to have a good product, but it's actually critical to be able to sell that potential of your product, of your skill set, and of your leadership. So I think like this, this kind of this first learning is is massive because it 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 answers the fallacy question of like, well, you know, I'm the smartest person in the room, or I have the most talented, or I have the most years of of experience. While that is necessary and it, it's important to be you know, very good at your job or have a great product, you know, you need to be able to sell the potential of what you're going to do. And so, you know, on a more personal level, when you, you go for, you know, an interview or you're trying to sell a product, um, don't just focus on, you know, the things that you've achieved in the past. Be very conscious to focus on all the things that you want to achieve with the skill set you have. So don't just talk about what your product can do today, but pitch your product roadmap and what it will do for the company in, in months and in years from now. Um, and remember that you know, a target is different from a strategy in people and companies. Don't just talk about where you want to be and what, and what, you, what you can do, but think about answers on how to actually get there as well, i.e. the strategy. Um, I think a lot of the time people confuse the target and the strategy just as they confuse you know, symptoms with problems. There's a lot of people solving a lot of symptoms but it's really tough to actually solve problems. And just as people talk about targets, it's much harder to actually talk about, you know, strategies of how to actually get there. Um, you know, the second piece 
of advice for, I think, selling yourself um, or your skill set or your product is that realize that you're not a born natural. Um, you know, I think to various degrees, some people are better than others, but like no one is born a great salesperson or born with the gift and confidence to kind of step up to the plate, you know, and, and sell their skill set. It takes, it takes work. Like, you know, people tune into the Olympics and they see athletes and they're like, wow, that make it look so easy. They must be just naturally gifted. And, and a lot of them, you know, are gifted, but they work and train every single day. And so in the same sense, why would we expect this any different? Um, you know, that, that some, we, we, we fall into this trap that some people are just, you know, these introverts and there's nothing we can do about that. And I think that's fundamentally untrue. Um, no one is just born with the skill set to sell their potential or potential over an idea or a team. You know, most people are exceptional at doing this will tell you it took a lot of time to develop and didn't come naturally. Um, you know, one thing, and, and this is kind of one of the most important things I learned, you know, in my career was when I first started, you know, my first job out of college at Clarion, I was the in-house economist and I, you know, I'd work tirelessly on economic models. That was my, my jam. You know, I liked building, um, you know, employment models and to kind of predict for the jobs numbers and everything else. Um, and obviously they would use that, you know, for, for trading, but I'm sure, um, all of us have kind of experienced that this at some point in their career where you're, you're doing all this work, all this heavy lifting, and it's in fact your manager or your coworker who gets all the recognition. Um, and the truth is it was actually my fault that I never got the recognition I deserved. Um, I fell into the, the same trap. I fell into this trap of thinking, you know, the best product will win. If I keep doing all this great work, surely everyone will just recognize that. Um, and, and, you know, give, give me the recognition and give me the promotion and, you know, my career would just keep going by itself. And that's completely wrong. Um, you know, I needed to sell my work and my skill set better, uh, to the people that mattered the most. And so, you know, I thought long and hard about this. It's kind of one of the old adages, like, you know, in life, sometimes you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. And so I kind of changed everything I did about my work. Um, you know, I made sure that you know, my work was, was only presented by me when I could to the, to the head of the, the head of the fund or, you know, to the, to the most important person I could. Um, I went out of my way to give my ideas and research directly to Peter. Uh, it took practice and it took time, but eventually everyone knew that I had the potential for more, but it was a sort of much more proactive, um, much more proactive uh, path that, that I realized. Um, I, I've seen this too many times. A lot of people, who are technically so gifted, they work really hard, they like put in all the hours, they work weekends, and they don't get the recognition they deserve. And, and you know, they, they feel bad, and I, I feel bad for them, but ultimately, like, they need to step up and actually sell themselves more and sell their, their talent more uh, to, to get ahead. And that's, that's, that, is, that is the world we, we live in. Um, you know, I think the third thing I would, 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 you know, piece of advice I would give you, um, and I know that this sounds actually really obvious, um, but you'd be amazed at how many startups I've invested in who show me their financing deck, um, you know, their pitch deck, which sell their achievements short and people who are too embarrassed or shy to talk about their achievements, um, they mention what they've done, but then they highlight all the problems that they have. Um, so never sell yourself short, always be honest. And when it comes to the drawbacks, you know, frame them as something that you are actually aware of. And that's actually great news because it means now that you're conscious of them, you can, you know, systematically work through improving them. Don't hide them, but don't make them the only thing that people remember, whether it's in the interview or you're pitching your company. Um, what we used to do was, you know, we'd, we'd pitch all the great achievements of what, you know, the product can do. We'd pitch, you know, where we want to be in, you know, the next sort of 12 months of funding. You know, here we want to break into this market or that market. And then we would actually have a whole segment of all the problems that we're, we're, we're running up against. And I think it's more honest because if you didn't have any problems, you probably wouldn't be asking for their money. Or so, so don't hide them away. Talk about them, but talk about them in a positive way because we know that these problems are here. The good news is we're aware of them and two, that we know how to fix them. And that's why we're, we're telling you about this. So I think that that's critical. Uh, and then what it does is it kind of heads off the path about the, you know, the path 
of you know awkward Q and A sessions at the end, where hopefully you, you've got out in front of them and have really addressed a lot of the questions that they have. Because we all know that there's some smart person in the room who's going to come up with like, yeah, but have you thought about that? So try and get it out there, whether you're doing it in an interview or whether you're pitching your product or your, your company. Be honest about it, but pitch it in a, a really positive way. Um, the the sort of fourth thing I would say, um, which is really important, and I've unfortunately I learned this a little bit too late in life, but hopefully there are some insights that I can give you, um, is value your time. Because if you don't, no one else will. Um, and it's okay to say no, no to things. Um, I know this may seem counterintuitive from kind of getting out there and selling yourself, but your time is the most valuable thing that you have aside from the skill set that you've trained hard over the years for. Um, and so it seems crazy that people don't value that appropriately. And if you don't, you know, people subconsciously pick up on that and they, val and they start valuing it just as you do, which is, is not very much. Um, it's like, have you ever heard sort of like, it's like an expensive by design tool versus a cheap knockoff. Um, the reason, there's a reason you kind of get what you pay for. Um, it's built with quality and it will last. So too often I see people stop progressing in their careers and even, uh, in their personal lives because they're constantly stressed out about having no time because they constantly say yes to everything. You think you, you need to think a little bit more strategically about the things that you say yes to and how you spend your time currency. What happens to people who constantly, who are constantly without time is, you know, they become myopic and they never progress. Um, we start to become passive and not proactive in how we deal with what the world throws at us. And as we used to say at a startup, it's like, we used to say you become a fire putter adder uh, and not a problem solver. So you're constantly, on the back foot every single day, there's a new fire that you have to put out because you're trying to do too much. You're trying to like break into too many markets or you're trying to have the product do too many things or just in your personal life or your professional life, you're saying yes to so many things um, at work and in your personal life that you, 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 you basically do 10 things okay rather than two things amazingly. Um, and I see that too often. And I think like if we need to take a little bit more time uh, to, to, to actually value the, the time we have and treat it as a currency. Uh, it's not something that you just give away all the time. Um, you know, there's, there's another piece uh, of, of advice, I think. Hopefully, I'm not sort of going too fast for everyone. I'll, I'll try and slow it down just a little bit. Um, I know that we have a Q&A session at the end, so um, I'm looking forward to that if I didn't cover, you know, everything and anything that you guys wanted to hear. Um, the other piece I think that is really important is what's called, you know, I read this book called The Culture Code many years ago. Um, and I, I, you know, it's only after years of, of doing what I did that I realized how important it was. Um, and in it, basically, he talks about how major, he was, he's the marketing guru for a lot of, a lot of big brands like L'Oreal and Jeep. And he talks about the major brands around the world trying to break into new markets. And L'Oreal in America was a big one, a big uh, marketing push that he worked on. And in every single case, the success of, you know, each marketing campaign came down to understanding your audience. You know, what actually drives them as a society and tap into a deeper understanding of their culture. Uh, in a very similar way on a more personal level, if you want to sell yourself, your company or your idea, you need to find a common connection with the group you're speaking to. And more importantly than anything is tell a story. Our minds love association. You know, when I was uh, fundraising over the many years, um, we, you know, and pitching my company, I would never, I never went through what the product did in a very technical way out the bat. You know, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't too many times I see other co-founders, you know, talk about their tech stack straight up, like in the first, you know, first slide. And you're like, what I would do instead is tell the story of how I met my co-founders, um, you know, the personal struggle we had with technology and getting a mortgage at home. And most of the people that we were pitching to can definitely relate to that. Um, they're all super frustrated at the process. Um, they all have families that were, you know, impacted by the financial crisis and understand how important housing is and more importantly, how important it is to have you know, a digital, a digital alternative. 
Um, so, you know, with that in mind, you know, you need to find something that, you know, everyone can relate to. Um, and I think like when you do tell it in layman's terms, um, again, you know, you meet these technical founders or even, you know, you, you meet people in academia who kind of like when you ask them, what do you do? Or, I mean, which is basically like, hey, you know, you kind of mini sell yourself to me. Um, they launch into like the very minutiae of what they're doing. And, you know, you the, the average person is not, you know, not an expert in, in biochemistry or it's not, you know, an expert in, you know, Java. Um, and so you need to tell it in layman's terms. And the hallmark, I remember when I was doing my master's thesis, you know, I basically, my supervisor threw it back at me and said like, look, you know, the hallmark of a good thesis is just for about any single person to be able to pick it up, read it, and kind of get a basic understanding of what your central idea is. Because at the end of the day, if no one can understand it, who, who are you really pitching it to? I mean, like, you're just gonna sell it to yourself? So I kind of feel like it, it really defeats the purpose. And a lot of people do that, uh, part particularly really, you know, good technical people. They, they forget, you know, that a lot of people aren't specialists and that they need to tell a story rather than kind of launch into the very sort of um, sort of the minutiae of the, the technicalities, which where you lose people. And then you're just basically pitching it to yourself. Um, one thing I think, um, people you know this is kind of the next piece i think is is really insightful um that we we tend to forget and i learned this a little bit later in life too uh in my career is you know don't assume they have the answer after all they, they're talking to you um and what that means is too often i see people sell them short sell short because they actually give the other person or the company too much credit you know, we tend to give big teams or companies the benefit of the doubt. Um, like, I remember thinking, oh, well, you know, they have loads of smart people and loads of money, and they must have all the answers, right? I mean, how could they not? They have so many resources. Um, but they don't. They really don't. And, I, re you know, I remember almost we lost a huge customer because we had a solution, which was our product, but the roadmap, which is a strategy, of how to implement it across teams and customers. And we just assumed they knew how to do that. Like we came to them for the strategy because it was their company after all and their employees. And we were really wrong. I mean, why would a company struggling for years to fix a problem, be able to invent a product and implement it? If they had, they would have done so already. So, you know, the most important part is that companies and people want you to propose a roadmap. Don't ever assume just because they have lots of really smart people and lots of money that they have the answers. And all too often we assume that they do. Um, so that that is something that, you know, bear in mind, especially, you know, as you're starting out on your careers, you just, you feel overwhelmed. Or, you know, I felt the same way. And it's like, well, all these people, they're really smart. They've got all this money. They probably know a lot more than I do. Uh, and they might have a little bit more knowledge. But it doesn't mean they're seeing the, the, the same problem from a different different perspective. And then sometimes that perspective can be the difference between you know, a successful startup or, or not. Um, here, here's probably the best piece of selling advice I ever received uh, from, from, he was head of marketing for uh, Tesla. And you know, we were chatting one time and he, he basically said, look, people hate being sold but they love to buy. And I kind of scratched my head, like, what, do, what does that mean? Like, what do you mean people hate being sold, but they love to buy? And what it comes down to is rather than have a kind of active and passive conversation with the other party, just like you would as a second car salesman, you know, you go into a lot, you're kind of passive, he, he or she's kind of on you about trying to get you to buy this and telling you this and that, and you know, you, you know why you need this in your life, um, you need to both experience it together and you, you basically show them how your product or you can make, you can make their lives better. Don't tell them that they need your product and your business to make their lives better. Let me give you an example. So, you know, I mentioned Tesla. I don't know if any of you, you've been to any of their showrooms, but they live, they live an embodiment of this kind of philosophy. They have almost zero salespeople in their showrooms. When you walk into the showroom, it's almost mostly cars. 
which are all open and you can play with them for hours. And that is specifically by design. Uh, clearly, if there's, there's always someone on hand <coughs> to answer any of the questions that you have, but what they do is they open it up, they open up the cards, you go in there with your family, your, your, you know, your kid plays in the car for hours, they love it, you're, you're, you're fiddling with like the touch screen, you're, you're fiddling with all parts of the car, playing with the door, seeing the quality of, of the build, and no one bothers you. Like, then this is the art, no one's selling it to you, but you're subconsciously already buying into this car, you're already buying into this product. And then by the time you, you're actually super interested, you want to go up and then go, hey, listen, you know, what about this? What about that? And at that moment, the person that you're asked, the salesperson, is experiencing the product with you together. They're not selling it to you. You're actually buying it. Um, you're learning about it, essentially being educated more about the product, and you're not really being sold a car. And I think, you know, whether you, there's a lot of contra controversy about whether Tesla's, you know, you know, should be the most valuable car company in the world. You know, I, I think it's kind of irrelevant. The, the, what's relevant for this discussion is whether you like them or not, they're an amazing marketing company. Uh, and they, they embody that sort of, you know, don't sell to people, have them buy it. And I think that's super important, not just for sort of products and companies, but also, you know, how you, how you, you know, market yourself, whether it's, you know, don't go in there and say, Hey, you need me. Otherwise your company's, you know, not going to be worth much or, you know, your team's not going to be as valuable, you know, without me, it really needs me. But basically, let them have, let them buy you, buy into your skill set. Let them see and discover the skill set that you have together. Um, which is why, like you know, the most genuine, authentic conversations. If you've been for an interview, which I, you have, it's, it's not you sitting there and someone just peppering you with a million questions. That's an awful interview. The best interviews are where it's like an organic discussion. You're basically experiencing and discovering your skill set together. Um, and you, you're sort of telling stories about like, hey, what's your experience here and your experience there? And it feels like you're just having a coffee with a friend over uh, having a great conversation. And those are the best. And I think that's, that's kind of what you, you, we always want to kind of aim to, <clears throat> if we can. You know, I think the, the last, well, so one of the other fundamental things that I think I found super helpful and, you know, when I, you know, 20 years ago, I, I was more of an introvert uh, than I, I am today. I, um, I definitely like sort of hiding behind monitors, playing with data, building models. Um, and, you know, over the years, you kind of, it, it takes work, just as I said. But over the years, this is philosophy of never eat alone. And one of the things that I try to do is, I know this might be tough for a lot of people who are, a little bit more shy or a little bit more introverted, <clears throat> but always be open to, to, to new relationships. So whenever you get the chance uh, to meet new people and forge new relationships, really try to do so. Um, you'll be astounded by the sort of people that you can meet and the opportunities that can open up. Um, pushing yourself a little by little, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone is actually a good thing. And it keeps our minds engaged and exp expands the realm of experience that you have. Um, you know, just, there are serendipitous, uh, meetings that you can have just by saying, Hey, you know what? Yeah, I definitely want to meet this person. Um, you know, what's the worst that can happen? You have some coffee over, you know, you have a nice conversation over some coffee. So, uh, it, it sometimes pays a lot of dividends to just go that extra mile with some people that you might not ordinarily reach out to. Um, okay. So I know that we probably have some questions coming in. Um, I think now might be a good time to kind of address some of those. Um, what, 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 how do I access those? And do you want to move to the Q and a session and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks so much for that. That was really like a really interesting talk about your, you know, your journey from university to founding blend and finding the wedge in the market and, you know, some really important takeaway there about taking your time and pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. So yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, we have some questions that were pre-submitted in, so we'll read off those ones first. And I think there's one that's just been submitted in the chat now, so we can okay. pick up on that one as well. Okay. Um, so one of the first questions was actually asked by Jen about kind of motivations. Jen, if you want to ask a question. <coughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, so my question is, what motivates you when you go to work? 
<clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I've been talking a lot. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> how? So I think it's a good question. I think that anyone who kind of says like, oh, the, you know, they jump out of bed in the morning and they're, they're super fully motivated is probably not telling the truth. I think that <clears throat> on some days, you know, <clears throat> it's fair to say some days you, you kind of want to give up. And there are other days that you can't wait to go to bed just to go to work the next day. And I think that, you know, we, we all have that. Um, I think that the, the, the one thing for me, and hopefully this will apply to you guys as well as you, as you, you know, progress during your career, is that try and do something for purpose. Um, and I don't, I don't, it doesn't always have to be, you know, trying to solve cancer. That's not what I really mean. Um, because like no one can beat that, but it's kind of do what's purposeful to you. <clears throat> I, you know, when I graduated, I had a lot of friends that kind of went off into, you know, they did math, economics, engineering, and they kind of went off into I industries that I think were primarily motivated by financial reasons. And I think that anyone who says money doesn't matter, isn't quite honest either. It does matter. We all need to pay rent. We all need to eat. But the truth is what, what, what you will have bad days in your career and what motivates you on those bad days is not going to be, you know, your paycheck. It's going to be something that you find meaningful in doing. And so for me, it was, I already, I, I remember the first time, you know, after releasing our product, um, I saw a complete stranger using my product or our product um, on their phone at a bus stop. And she had, uh, she had her two kids with her and she was, you know, filling in like a mortgage application while she had time um, waiting for the bus. And <clears throat> that's huge motivation because it's kind of like you're seeing something that was, you know, years ago, just nothing but an idea or something that you got laughed out of the, the room for actually being used by someone who needs it. And hopefully, you know, we found out our product, you know, also opens up um, a lot of opportunity and potential for low income families because they can do it on their phone uh, and it's impactful in their lives. And I think like that is that is hugely motivating. And e even on the days that are 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 tough, because there will be, um, I just remember that. And I remember that, you know, there is an impact on people's lives and it's and hopefully you're making making it better. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And that for me is like super motivating. And I think that for you, whatever you're, you're going to do with your career and your, and your, in your life, hopefully you, you kind of find something like that. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's hopefully I've answered your question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I just had one more as well, if that's okay. Sure. Um, yeah. I was wondering, have, have you actually ever met Elon Musk? And if you have, what is he like? <laughs> Yes. No, I know, I know Elon fairly well. <clears throat> the first thing um, I will tell you is that he's extremely tall. He's an extremely tall man. Um, and that, <laughs> that's kind of the first thing you don't realize but when you meet him. He's like, you know, six, three or four. He's pretty tall. Um, he, he's incredibly smart. Um, he is surprisingly awkward. Um, and, you know, like, you know, so, you know, I've never worked with Elon, obviously, but, you know, with Peter, I would always meet him at like, you know, Christmas parties or, you know, functions. And, you know, he was the producer on Thank You for Smoking, which was a movie. <clears throat> and um, I met him at the, the premiere there. He is incredibly smart. He's surprisingly awkward. Um, you know, he would, he's the kind of guy like we go up and say hi. He's like, hey. Uh, and then you, you, he's more into talking about sort of more geeky things rather than like talking about, um, you know, the weather. Uh, I would say the one thing about that I know about Elon uh, very personally is that he's the sort of person that processes risk very differently from normal human beings. Uh, and I don't mean that in the sort of, there are a lot of people like professional gamblers. There are people that, you know, race car drivers. They, I, th I think that, you know, with the way that he calculates risk uh, is really different from other people. He's like one of the few people I know that is willing to and has done gone bankrupt multiple times uh, in the pursuit of trying to, you know, see his idea. Um, and I, that, that's, that's really admirable. Um, look, he's a, he's, he's kind of a divisive figure for some people. Some people think, you know, like, Oh, Elon, Hey, that guy, his company's overvalued. Other people love him. And there's a little bit of a cult. Um, but the truth is I kind of feel like it's both are irrelevant. I think that, 
as long as he kind of inspires younger people to go after their dream or find purpose in in what they want to do and hopefully you know make lives people's lives better after all that's what we're doing here um it's it's definitely not to be the richest man in the cemetery um as long as it inspires young people to kind of do that i'm you know i'm all for it so thanks for that erin thank you um okay so we have another question from shahab about kind of selling your product in a competitive market are you there to ask the question yes thank you erin uh, for that great speech uh, my question is how can one make themselves or their products stand out in a highly competitive market especially when they're competitors are better than them or yep. they have a product? Yep, <clears throat> this, is, this is actually a great question um, and something that I, we, we had to deal with as well. So, you know, first off, a lot of people think that the first way to kind of compete with, uh, like, so if you're a new company and you're going into a market and there's a lot of incumbents, um, they usually have big teams, they have marketing budgets that are so big. In fact, your marketing budget of some of the companies that you're trying to compete with are bigger than your own company. Um, and so my advice would be, do not try and compete with them on marketing and things like that. So that's the first piece of advice. Like don't, don't try and compete with them because they will just crush you. I think that, and this is what we did, is that there are loads of other ways that you can compete with uh, with competitors that are perhaps in the market, have more resources than you, and might actually have a product that works better. The first is there are loads of like sort of corporate strategies. And I know that kind of sounds a little bit boring, but it's kind of cool because what you can do is like, for, for instance, we offered sort of a freemium model. It's like, you know, you can focus on pricing. We, we even offered at some point, which was a roaring success, instead of marketing to the, the, you know the, the our competitors customers what we would do is offer to pay them out of the, the contract that they had with with their so then the switching cost of the sunk cost is uh is, is almost zero to them so there's little things you can do like that um there's also ways where you can say price price your product such that um it's kind of a flat price all you can eat model um and the point is what happens is customers as long as you start getting customers on your product and on your platform then what you start to do is one, you start getting more revenue in the in the door, so you can actually start building your product, paying engineers, um, or you know whoever it is, what kind of product, not necessarily all tech, but whatever product you you need to build it out, and you can start to compete a little bit better uh, on that way on product as well. So you can improve your product. Um, the other way uh, that we did, and I think that this is the most important. So there's like marketing you can try, but I wouldn't recommend it. You'll be out you'll be outgunned. I would focus where you can on the pricing and on the corporate corporate strategy. You can so some amazing leverage there. But I think that the, the third way, which is, you know, maybe it's just unique to what we did. But, you know, when we went into the market, there were two other companies that didn't do what we did, but could easily, they were kind of in that environment, right? And what we did was instead of trying to compete with them on, um, like some of them would just do processing of paperwork instead of trying to compete with them, which we could never compete with, the, the product was really established, it was, would, would be much better than what we try to do. Um, we took a totally different tact and we focused on consumer experience. And so while they were focused on, hey, uh, you know, like, you know, your customer will go on for, for the competitor, the customer will go on. It was an awful experience, but it worked, right? And what we did was we want to make this experience amazing for you. And yeah, there might be a few bugs, but I got to tell you, it was so it was so much less stress. It was so much easier. I didn't have to like print off vast amounts of sheets. I didn't have to go find find X Y Z number. It was all there in a digital way. Um, and so over time, as we as our customer base grew and grew, we were able to compete on a similar playing field as the others. So hopefully, those kind of three things um, are helpful. Thank you. Thanks for that, Erin. Um, so I have another question here, um, which is about, it's from Liana, and it's about spotting successful business plans. Are you there, Liana, to answer the question? <laughs> well, I think you might be on mute, Liana. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Oh, okay. Hi, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Um, so my question is, when looking at a business plan for you, what are the key indicators that it will be successful? Huh. You know, this is, this, this is kind of similar to um, a question about like, you know, what do I look for in companies that I invest in or I've seen others invest in? Um, and so hopefully it kind of opens, answers both. But so first of all, there's no like golden rule. If there were, there would be a lot of even super wealthy people everywhere. Um, but I definitely have sort of three things that I look for that I've also seen, you know, Peter look for, I've seen other successful people look for is if you're looking at a company or a company's business plan, um, one of the, I mean, I'm, I'm talking early stage, not later stage, but early stage where they're, they're getting the company off the ground. You know, what do I look for? The first is um, have the founders or the people running the company, have they worked together, you know, before? And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that's interesting that you got to remember <coughs> is that you could, you could have a great idea and if you have a terrible team, they will, they will actually destroy the idea. And sometimes, and what I'm trying to say is like, the team that you work with is sometimes more important than the idea itself. So for example, if you have an amazing team together that have worked together before, and you have a kind of half-baked idea or a mediocre idea, that team can actually pivot and make it successful. But the reverse is sometimes not true. So I've seen plenty of amazing ideas and the team, you know, for one or better, kind of sucked. And they basically they went down all these wrong paths and they, and they, and they were not successful in that way. So just, just remember that team is actually incredibly important and even sometimes more so than the idea or, or, or the product itself. So you, I mean, you obviously want a great product, but, but remember team is, 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 is really important. The second thing is, <clears throat> um, is the product inevitable? And what I mean by this is, um, so one thing, like for, for example, one thing, you know, Blend, we do digital mortgages, right? And one thing I have to ask myself is, let's just pretend that Blend didn't exist. What we want to do is essentially make this financial transaction a digital and completely paperless. Do I see my children going into a bank in 20 years time and filling in thousand paper documents like that doesn't seem normal to me that doesn't seem like the future where we're going to be in, in you know in 2040 i think so there's this kind of big macro i guess like you know more of an overarching theme is the macro trend there um so so whether it's like you know i'm biased as my company but i feel like whether my company did it or not someone would have done this and so i think the second thing is you really got to think about like is the company i'm looking at is what they're doing like kind of inevitable? Like this is something that I can see people using in the future, whether it's them or it's someone else. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> I think that's that's important. Um, and then the third one would probably be what's called sort of product market fit. And so um, you can create a company in two ways. You can either go, you know, you can either start from bottom bottom up, where you kind of find a pain point. Um, you know, like I'm really like, I'm really tired of filling all these paper documents. I'm going to start a company that gets rid of that. Or what you can do is, you know, top down where you basically build a product that you think people need, <clears throat> but they don't really use You don't really know. Like, so, you know, Steve jobs did this. I mean, like, no, he was like, no, no, no. You're, you're thinking about computers all the wrong way. I'm going to get, you know, get a product to you that you don't even know you need yet. And. Mm -hmm. There's no wrong or right answer. Some are, you know, some, 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 some way, but you know, what I would suggest in either way, whether it's a company that's built from, you know, trying to fix a real world problem today or a company that's kind of very high level and trying to sell you or give you a product in your hands that you didn't know you needed yet. Um, make sure that ultimately people want the product and they want you know, that, that's extremely important. I see a lot of companies that basically are trying to solve problems that no one really has. So uh, I'll give you a prime example. There's a, couple, there's a couple of companies in San Francisco that want to deliver burritos via a drug. It's like, 
I, that's not a real world. That's not a problem that I think like people are really suffering right now for, for burritos to be delivered by drone. Um, and ultimately these things are, you know, born out over the next couple of years and they don't work. So make sure that people use it. They want to use it. Would you use it? Would you tell your, 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 your friends to use it? Um, so yeah, I think those are the three things. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks guys for your pre submitted questions. I reckon we'll go to the ones from the chat. Um, Ronak, do you want to answer, ask your question about Tesla? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, Aaron. Um, hey. Thank you so much. <clears throat> that was really uh, interesting. Um, all of the points you mentioned, uh, that, yeah, there's definitely a lot of things that I've gained, so thanks for that. Um, my question was more about the Tesla example that you gave. Um, I was just wondering, so you mentioned about how people went and actually played with the product itself and mm -hmm. that product kind of marketed itself because it was so sophisticated designed. So like the product was good enough, but how would somebody tackle or like do in situations where the product itself is not that appealing? So if you make a software product, you have to kind of guide people. So yes. it's not a physical product like Tesla. So what could you elaborate on that point? Yeah, no, I, I hear you. So, um, so to, to sort of answer the question <clears throat> or put it a different way, it's like, you know, you have a physical car in front of you. It's kind of very easy to play with, but you know, it's, sometimes you have a product that is not intuitive that you can't just put down on the table and for people to play with. Um, so I guess like what I would suggest in that situation, just like if you went to an interview, um, you can't put your skill set on the table, like physically and have them play with it. It's the same idea. What you want to do is when you present your product or if say if you're, you have your product and as I say, it's a quite complicated tech product um, and you're sitting down with either a customer or an investor, what you want to do is don't talk at them and tell them like, here's what this does. You need this to fix this problem. Here's what this one does. You need to fix this problem. Just the same as, you know, when you went, if you were going to an interview at a job, you wouldn't sit there and say, Hey, listen, I got a you know math degree, so that'll fix your finance problem. Or you know, you would what you would what you would do instead is actually go through it with your customer, actually go through it with your investor, so that you're you're kind of both discovering it together. And in actual fact, like for the for the example of maybe like a, a, a product that's quite hard, like a tech product or a platform, what I would suggest is actually let them try and play with them first. So they're actually experiencing, put them in the driver's seat so to speak, so that they're actually going through your product themselves and you're not, you know, kind of selling it to them. So they, oh, what does this do? Okay. So then you're both experiencing your product together um, is much better. You will have more success doing that than the guy just sits there, the person just sits there and you're just telling them why your, your product's great. Or you're at the interview and what I would suggest is talk about the experiences that you had at your previous job, talk about the experience you had, you know, at your university, um, rather than just kind of tell them, you know, bullet points and sell to them that way and why they need you. Um, again, I, I understand like, you know, it's very easy, a little easier for, for Tesla to just put a car down, but it's the same principle. Don't try and just sort of sell them and tell them why they need it. Show them, sit down and experience it with them. And I guarantee you, just as you would like, just as you would with your friend. I mean, if you if you had built a, pro, a, a you know a tech product at home, you'd be like, hey, look at this. This this is this is so cool. This is what I built. Treat it more like that, so that they're experiencing it with you. Not, hey, I have this product. You really need this to make your life better. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. That was a great question. That one, um, Chris. You have a question there about kind of staying modest. Do you want to ask ask your question? Oh, yeah. uh, thanks for your time and sort of giving all the tips. I think they'll be really useful. Um, so I think you kind of covered this slightly in your, in terms of like, like don't sell to them, like go on that journey with them and share them. But I wonder if you had sort of any other specific tips in terms of when you're selling in how to kind of stay modest, sort of in particular when you're trying to sort of sell your own skill set. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> it's a good question because like, first of all, no one likes a braggart. Um, sitting down and, and selling how wonderful you are. Uh, the, it's kind of a, there's also like kind of a fine line between arrogance and confidence. And effectively, what it's kind of what you're asking. Like, how do you, how do you talk about, um, you know, your skill set and the, the accomplishments, the accomplishments that you've, you've done, completed, and do it in a way that you're not sort of sitting there and, you know, how amazing I am. 
Um, honestly, I do think if I do think there are two things. I think that if you start the conversation, whether it's in an interview and you're talking about your skill set, um, if you if you give them context about who you are, you know, if you if you're able to do that, you know, how you know, give them a story about, you know, context about the accomplishments. So like whether it's you you won a scholarship or uh, you won some sort of you know international award or you know awarded chef like whatever it is, instead of just saying hey I got this on I I'm amazing, what I would say is like hey you know tell them the backstory, tell them like hey you know is is, is kind of crazy I worked you know abroad for for a year and I worked at this nonprofit and you know it was super fun and you know I ended up winning this award which is which was really cool and it was really fulfilling. So I think like give them context for the accomplishment and don't just tell them that you got it. It's like, you know, I'm the greatest, give them context and story around it. And the second piece is, you know, be genuine. You know, I think, um, you know, I, I think like if with all of you, you know, when you go out with your friends and you're just sort of having a, a conversation with us over coffee or tea, you know, and you, and they ask about your life, they're like, Hey, how's it going? And you're like, yeah, it's going really well. Um, you know, I, I got, you know, I won CFO of the year and they're like, oh, that's awesome. And it's, it's more, they can tell that you're not bragging, but you're just being genuine about the things that are happening in your life. And so I think that those are the two, two recommendations. I would say, try and focus that you have confidence that you're not arrogant and you can do that by essentially giving context for, for your accomplishments, you know, tell them a little bit of backstory, um, and how it happened and, and why you got it. And, and then just sort of be, just be genuine about it. Not, not, you know, clearly trying to get something from them, but just be genuine about the accomplishments that you have. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I reckon we probably only have time for one more. Um, so I think I'll go for Catherine's question. So I reckon Mohammed, yours has kind of already been answered a little bit. Um, so Catherine, do you want to ask yours? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Erin, um, so much for the session. I've really enjoyed it and I've been writing down notes endlessly. Um, my question was just about when you were talking about saying that humans have a bias over something more potential. Uh -huh. um, so how talking more from selling yourself rather than a product, how did you realise what your potential skill set was and then how do you sell and convince the interviewer um, of this potential? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question and a tough one. <clears throat> so, you know, I think what you need to do in sort of an interview and your skill set. So I guess like there's two questions there. The first question is, how did I realize the potential, you know, my potential given the skill set I have? And then the sort of two part question is, how do I convince the other person that I have potential? And I think that there are kind of two separate questions. The first one is, you know, I think the first one is a very personal one. I think that <clears throat> you have a certain skill set that you've developed, whether at university or or another means vocational, whatever. And I think that the potential that you have for your skill set is something that you need to feel, you need to come to a decision by yourself. It's kind of, um, I really, really find purpose in, you know, doing X, Y, and Z. And I find it, in, it, it, it in, enjoyable given the skill set. So whether it's like, you know, I'm an engineer and I, I love to build things or, you know, I'm an, uh, you know, I'm an artist and I love to, to paint things. So it, I think that should be a more organic piece for you when it comes down to actually convincing other people of your potential. Here's what I would do. I would say that in an interview and it, it comes down to, to what I've seen most often is, uh, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people over the years and they kind of sit down and immediately they just say, well, you know, I was, uh, you know, I, I led a team of 50 people and um, I was I was the greatest at it. And, uh, you know, I have like two degrees and I graduated top of my year. And so, you know, I think that qualifies me to run your company or to be part of your team. Um, don't do that. I think that's just talking about the things that you have have done, which or positive, which is great. But what I would try and say, mention those, but focus also more on you know i want to do more with what i've done so that's why i've been into like that's why i'm at this interview it's like listen i have a skill set that's you know i'm an engineer based or you know i have a skill set like with with english and i'm really good I, I worked at this small paper as a journalist and i have so much more to grow 
And I'm here to do that with your company or in this job or in this team, in this role. So too, too often people just focus on what they have done and not enough about like, hey, what do I really want to do? So if, I'll give you an example. I ran this finance team at, at, at Bland for a long time. And my direct report, she was phenomenal. She was phenomenal. She was really good. Um, my right-hand person. And it was it was just hard because every year at her review, it's just like we, we sat there and went through all the things that she did well, like her accolades were amazing. And I kept saying, like, what do you want to go here? Like, do you want my job? Do you want like, what do you want to just tell me what you want? And she could never, I think that she never really sat down and thought about like, hey, what what is my, I have so much potential, but what do I want to do with that? Um, and sometimes like people often too, you think too much about like, have I ticked all the right boxes of all these accomplishments and what they want in this job and not about like what I can do, where do I actually want to go with it? And so um, I think that's just as important. Thank you. Yeah, that was really interesting. Thanks, Erin. Um, so yeah, I think we should end there then. And um, as we've done before, could we all just like give a little round of applause to Erin? <laughs> well, thanks very much. Thanks for your time. Thanks for turning up. <laughs>